Good morning to all of you. Thank you for attending this uh, Shallow Geothermal Days. It's the third edition. And as you can see, it's an event organized by many organizations. Um, EJEC Geothermal, the Renewable Heating and Cooling Platform. Geotronet, the Geothermal uh, DAC Cost Action. The MUSE Project, Eurogeo Surveys. And also today, we have a pleasure to have a partner with EHPA. Thomas Novaki is there with us. And there have been also partners for the previous editions. Um, we still have people to connect. So as usual, with this webinar, we will start in one to two minutes. Thank you. Okay, I checked my clock and now it's officially 10 past two, so we can have a regular two minutes delay to start an event and webinar. As I say, we will have today the shallow geothermal days, the first day of the shallow geothermal days. Unfortunately, as last year, we will have to have it in a virtual mode. The first edition was a success in a physical meeting in Brussels, but for two years now, we have to do that in a virtual mode. The shallow geothermal is today about policy and market, on Thursday, we have technologies and best practices. And next week, as a side event, on uh, Tuesday, 14th of December, we have on certification uh, and of installers and, and training a debate and after the annual meeting of GeoTrainet. But what is the agenda today of the policy and market session? So you can see we have a great panelist. Um, and, and, and speakers. So what we would like to, to look at today is that what are first the upcoming regulations proposed by the European Commission, planned on 14th of December about EPBD, but also for one to two years, we have seen the Renovation Wave initiative, we have seen EED publish an update of the Renewable Energy Directive with provision and building. So what can we expect from that? And Thomas Garabetian from EJEC will uh, first uh, present a short overview of the new provisions, but after we can have with panelists some, some discussions. We will have from Javier um, a presentation of a Spanish scheme and certification, so an implementation of one provision of a race directive, or we can have certification and training of professionals, small scale renewable installers, and in this case, mainly geothermal pumps installers. After, I will give the floor to Thomas Novak from EHPA to plan a fantastic, and I really recommend you to read this paper on energy taxation. I think it was in September, if I'm right, um, and it was really timely when you see all the discussion on high energy prices, taxation, energy taxation, electricity and gas is, is a key topic. So we really welcome this initiative from EHPA, and we will hear today from Thomas what is uh, about. And the fourth speakers we have today is Gregor Godzel from the Geocast Survey of Austria. He will present some results of a project MUSE, but it's going beyond. It's an initiative also. We have a Geocast Survey about the traffic light systems and urban planning, a complex topic, how we can develop uh, our project um, at, a, at a city level. You could see that each presentation has a slot of 20 minutes. Uh, it's uh, according to the speakers, five to 10 minutes presentation and after we engage with you. So you have different modes to engage. You can chat um, in the option you have with get to webinar. You can ask a question to the speakers, but also we uh, can have some speakers, some questions between the panelists during the 10 minutes Q&A and also uh, from my side if you don't have any questions. So with that, I first give the floor to the first speaker, Thomas Garbetian, 
to start with a presentation from the Renovant Wave to EPBD. Thomas, floor is yours. Thank you, Philippe. Um, so, indeed, I will uh, first share my screen. So, you should now be able to see. All right, so indeed, um, my presentation is going to, to be around the um, basically the whole dynamic of the building policies at the European level, because uh, basically we have had the presentation of a EU renovation wave by the European Commission, which really starts from the, uh, um, the fact that renovation rates of buildings are far too low, especially deep renovation, uh, and therefore we don't have a, a quick enough modernization of the building stock to meet the uh, European energy and climate objectives, but also there is a, a, a very important missed opportunity in terms of uh, um, job creation, uh, value creation, quality of the building stock, reduction of energy poverty, etc. Uh, that goes with this fairly lackluster uh, development of, the, of renovation rates uh, in Europe uh, with some differences with some countries that are better than others, but overall uh, the, the situation is not optimal, let's say. Uh, so therefore the Commission proposed this uh, European renovation wave as part of, at the same time, the European Green Deal, which predates the COVID pandemic, but it was very quickly introduced in the EU recovery package as one of the key measures to really accompany the, the recovery of the uh, European economy uh, following the, the lockdowns at the beginning of 2020, which really had uh, a dramatic impact. And then the Commission came up with a fairly consistent uh, financial uh, plan for financial support and supporting reno energy renovation, notably of buildings, is one of the, the important aspects. So the goal of the renovation wave overall is 35 million additional building units renovated by 2030. So it's really about creating capacity for the, the renovation uh, industry to be able to, to really ramp up and scale up uh, uh, yeah, renovation and especially also quality energy renovation. Uh, following uh, this, uh, this renovation wave, we have had also the promotion of the Fit for 55 package. And there we really had, uh, let's say, the, something of a changing paradigm with uh, the Commission looking with the Fit for 55 package to really align uh, the European energy efficiency and renewable energy policies, and as well, obviously, carbon emissions. Uh, pathways with carbon neutrality by 2050, which is the objective really enshrined by the European Green Deal uh, on the long term uh, and adopted by the Commission, by the Council, by the Parliament. So this is uh, now basically uh, um, something uh, maybe not entirely binding, but a very strong uh, deadline for, for the European uh, uh, union. Uh, so FIT for 55 stands for reducing by 55% greenhouse gases emissions by 90, uh, compared to uh, 1990. Uh, and this typically means uh, reductions of energy efficiency, uh, I mean, a higher energy efficiency target to uh, about 38% and a higher uh, renewable target to about uh, 40% uh, by 2030. Uh, and there, the building sector really becomes a core segment of the uh, European energy policy uh, because typically we have to start looking a bit more, more deeply at the transformation of our energy system. We are already quite far ahead in the um, dynamics for the decarbonization of the electricity sector although uh, more obviously needs to be done. We are really not there yet, only about uh, a third of the, the electricity sector is, is renewable today. But uh, it's really in the building sector where policies have not really been implemented enough. We don't have enough visibility and there are no clear pathway to go towards decarbonization. Then as part of this Fit for 55 package, we had the presentation of the Energy Efficiency Directive, which starts to put some elements to really go towards uh, a deep decarbonization of the building stock. So typically we have an interesting model of a statistical incentive 
to uh, facilitate the development of, uh, of heat pumps with the renewable energy from, uh, from heat pumps to be excluded from primary energy accounting. So really to consider heat pump at the same time as a renewable energy uh, uh, installation in the renewable energy directive and at the same time as a very interesting efficiency uh, tool in the ED by considering that the energy used from heat pump is only the, the auxiliary energy to, to run the pump and not the uh, ambient or geothermal energy that is uh, um, extracted from, from the environment. Um, then uh, there are also reinforcement of measures on heating and cooling assessment and planning, which is uh, quite important. Uh, and a also a doubling of the rate of the energy savings obligation after 2023. Um, so meaning typically this energy savings obligation so far has been one of the the main uh, policies justifying national uh, incentives towards uh, deeper uh, energy renovation of buildings. So this is quite a, an important tool. Um, then we have also specific measures to direct energy efficiency uh, support to, to solve energy poverty. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, I will just uh, very quickly uh, plug my computer. I see it's not being very happy. All right, uh, apologies for that. Um, so now what is coming up following the, the ED, we also have the Renewable Energy Directive, which is introducing some reinforced measures uh, with a target for renewables in the building. Uh, yeah, renewable heating and cooling in the building sector, and as well um, a reinforced target for renewables in heating and cooling. Uh, but then we have the Commission that is proposing a revision of the energy performance uh, of buildings directive, which will be presented uh, hopefully in December 2021 if we don't have any uh, delays. Uh, and this revision of the EPBD really aims to align the uh, buildings directive with imperatives of the Fit for 55 package. So to have the building sector really contribute to this higher greenhouse target re emission reduction, uh, uh, yeah, target for greenhouse emission reduction, and obviously the uh, related efficiency and renewables target. But it's also, uh, interestingly, a revision to align the PBD with itself, because in the energy performance of building directive, we have an objective of decarbonization of the building stock by 2050. But so far, the implementing measures to get there are not satisfactory. Uh, and part of the, uh, the aim of this revision is really to go towards this internal consistency and to have a building directive that is really setting up the pathways and establishing the, uh, let's say, um, basic standards and criteria to enable this decarbonization of the building stock. So um, among the things that we could expect, uh, obviously some of these may, uh, might not be there. We might have some uh, additional uh, provisions, but uh, here we, this is all, let's say, in the, in the realm of possibilities, but we could have a reinforcement of the long-term renovation strategies, uh, which are currently the main instrument of the PBD to let's say outline how we are going to get to this uh, decarbonized building stock so this is quite clearly going to be a uh, strength and uh, what this could entail is for instance that these long-term renovation strategies are more detailed more binding uh, and there's a greater degree of accountability as part of the climate governance framework uh, which is already governing the renewable energy directive and the energy efficiency directive um, a much more detailed planning of building energy renovation is likely to, to be on the table as well. Um, we could also look at the shift uh, of the focus of the directive towards uh, something like zero emission buildings, because currently the EPBD is really striving towards the implementation of nearly zero energy buildings, which do not have to be entirely decarbonized. They have to be mostly decarbonized, let's say, to have very small energy needs and that much of these remaining energy needs are covered by uh, renewable energy. But what we are uh, hoping that the, the, we will move towards and what is necessary is that we move towards buildings that are entirely efficient and renewables as let's say the default uh, 
type of building that uh, EPBD must uh, must really promote. Um, and then um, one very important uh, aspect for the internal consistency of the EPBD, uh, and that we could expect, is also to have measures to prevent financial support to fossil boilers, if not a full phase out of fossil fuels in the building sector, with really uh, detailed uh, measures to, to plan this phase out. Um, some upgraded requirements on new and deeply renovated buildings. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, upgraded performance, re yeah, uh, performance requirements, or really to have a higher degree of um, stringency on what building owners must do to really uh, uh, be consistent with the PBD when they do a deep renovation, for instance. Um, minimum energy performance standards for the, the building stock overall. Um, and this, I will come back a bit later on how this could be uh, enforced as well. Um, a greater focus on energy system integration. So this was already a little bit the case with the 2018 review of the EPBD, where the transport sector really entered the building with uh, requirements for uh, electric vehicle uh, chargers, etc. But we are likely to see also a greater degree of integration of uh, equally the heating and cooling systems, with, for instance, things like demand response from uh, from building, uh, yeah, uh, heat pumps, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, and then as well, we could expect to have um, detailed measures for how to finance this energy renovation of buildings, because. Obviously, this is always an outstanding point, but how do we get there? Uh, we can have standards, we can have um, technologies available, etc. But if households are not able to invest and access them, uh, it is uh, it is complicated to to rescale them up. Um, just uh, as I'm going to try not to be too too long, but to to have a quick uh, overview of two cases uh, of upgrades in the um, building energy performance uh, regulations of, uh, yeah, of two countries. So the first one is a French case, and this could be also a, an interesting uh, template on what we might move towards at the, at the European uh, level. So in, in the case of the French ERI 2020, uh, 2020 uh, we are uh, seeing uh, that the life cycle assessment of buildings is going to also include material use to really have um, uh, a carbon footprint of the building that is not only looking at whether you do use uh, fossil fuel, but maybe starting from the principle that the building must be decarbonized and even then still be quite uh, performant in terms of emissions, so using materials that either uh, lock in uh, carbon storage or this kind of things. Um, then uh, we also have a much greater emphasis on an efficient use of renewable energy in the buildings, which typically also requirement on efficiency of renewable appliances. And there uh, at the shallow geothermal uh, conference, so uh, it is um, it is quite an interesting trend. So uh, typically, a very efficient use of renewable energy is quite important, and it's a, a very good thing to use heat pumps typically with high coefficient of performance. Uh, or the possibility, for instance, to use uh, free cooling for for geothermal heat pump, and this is also going to be a very interesting change in the in the French uh, framework, with a focus on future climate and the introduction of indicators for summer comfort uh, to to really uh, grade the the building energy performance, and then also uh, requirements for no fossil fuels in new or deeply renovated buildings. Um, then uh, looking at another case, so Flanders, the, the Flemish region of, uh, of Belgium, uh, is also upgrading its, uh, its uh, building uh, energy performance requirements. And a very interesting trend uh, measure, let's say, is that from 2023, uh, newly acquired buildings must be upgraded if they are from the uh, energy performance class E to the energy per performance class D. So there, this is an interesting measure for, uh, it is very likely to have a, a, a strong impact because it is binding and all buildings will have to go through that. Uh, however, 
uh, there are obviously critics in terms of the, the level of ambition because um, it, it is not consistent with the uh, internal uh, Flemish objective of an A-rated building stock by 2050. Because obviously, if you renovate uh, a building, let's say in 2025, uh, 2D, it is likely to, to not be that performant as well in, uh, in 2050, 20 years later. Um, so maybe a bit to, to conclude. Um, and that's uh, really a direct transition to, to my precedent point. Consistency with 2050 is key when we look at the uh, building renovation. Um, we must really look at policy that uh, implements a 100% renewable and efficient energy system. Um, we only have about one full heating and cooling replacement cycle between well, today, uh, I write 2020 by force of habit, but we are already basically in 2022 and 2050. Um, then we must really start looking in renewable heating and cooling market infrastructure. Um, today, we still are in a very much gas heating and cooling market infrastructure. Uh, we have seen it over the past six months with the explosion of the cost of gas, the impact it has on energy poverty, on the finances uh, of businesses and households. Um, this morning in the Belgian news, uh, we had the, the news that uh, a utility is, uh, is uh, filing for bankruptcy because of this change in energy cost with uh, 70,000 households that will have to now subscribe to very expensive uh, new uh, uh, gas and electricity uh, costs. So these type of things have an impact also today. But if we start looking in this, uh, this renewability and cooling market structure, we can also have more resilience to, to this type of disruption. Uh, the fossil fuel phase out must really start now because heating and cooling, as we know, is, let's say, a zero sum game. If you have a gas boiler, you do not have uh, a heat pump. Uh, so it's really about um, having the right technologies and creating this past dependency in terms of um, know-how of installers, in terms of, um, well, typically just deliver infrastructure in buildings, these kind of things for these uh, renewable solutions of tomorrow. Uh, and then obviously the standard and planning must be consistent with 2050 uh, from today, let's say, uh, to, to really be able to implement this decarbonization of the building stock. So thank you all for, for your attention and uh, I look forward to, to the discussion. Thank you, Thomas, for this uh, presentation. Indeed, we have uh, five minutes for Q&A. Um, I don't know if perhaps already a question from the audience or from the panelists, but in the meantime, yes, Thomas, you want to intervene? Uh, if, if, if I may, I do have a question, and that's something that nobody could have answered, so maybe you don't know either, but it, I would be very interested. So it's a very interesting presentation, and I fully share the need for early action and for an early announcement of the measures. What I don't understand is that the Commission has, or we have, near zero energy building standards in place, and they are pretty much completely ignored. If I read Commission communication, it seems as if this has never been the case, and we have to reinvent the wheel. Do you have any idea why? I mean, is, is that just accepted as failure? So near zero energy doesn't work. So whoosh, let's start something new. Or is there something else that I just didn't catch? Uh, that's a, a very good question. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not sure whether I, I, I can answer there. Um, what I remember is that what is crazy, Thomas, in this topic is that in 2012, for the first EPB, it was already a big debate, no? Near zero energy, and we had a big debate on that. And ten years after, we are still debating on that. Also, I don't. It's a big question mark. Javier, you you have an idea? You you are muted. Uh, well, I I don't have an idea why this is happening, but this is indeed here also the case. I think these are these provisions are uh, mostly ignored. I think. Yeah. And first of all, by the public uh, public public sector, which is I think uh, the key. Because if the, pub, the public sector is not driving this, uh, well, the private sector is very difficult to uh, to motivate to make all these changes. And uh, here in Spain, we are seeing that uh, this no, nobody is enforcing really to to take a look on on this renovation rate in public buildings, which are indeed uh, somehow written there, but but not active, not not enforced. Yeah. And I don't know why. I don't know why. Then I'm, I'm getting very skeptical if this is the case. Why should we trust any other measure that is now proposed should be more successful? Good question. 
is uh, yeah. all about I mean, what we also need. Also on the 14, because on the 14th of December, we expect a second energy and climate package, notably on the gas market. And, and will the Commission be consistent in measures where we expect uh, uh, growth and renewable heating and cooling and energy efficiency? But if we still protect the gas market, how this will be consistent? Do you have some ideas? Thomas, maybe to start with, and Thomas Garabetian after overall. Yes, yeah. I mean maybe also to to overall. I think uh, we have had until um, 2020 the the failure indeed of a lot of the buildings and energy efficiency policies. Um, maybe there's some form of desire from the Commission to update and uh, start from a, let's say not a maybe not a blank sheet, but to to really uh, um, have a new framework and uh, a stronger emphasis on. Uh, on implementation. I mean, we have now a proposed bindingness on the efficiency target, which was not the case. Um, there's probably going to be a much stronger enforcement as well of the uh, energy performance of buildings. So I think from the part of the Commission, which obviously uh, working on, uh, on the EU is maybe all, we, uh, all that I, I can comment, but there's not been a lot of enforcement until now on uh, building policies. And this might change now, and uh, and that might be part of the hopefully answer to to really have successful buildings policies. Mm -hmm. Do you have a last comment to conclude this? No, maybe we will come back again in here because it's a big topic. And so thank you, uh, Thomas, for this first overall uh, presentation on the framework for policy and regulations. Now I will give the floor to Javier Oshuriaga from. Uh, different entities, the chairman of the Geothermal Panel, the president of Geotrenet, of Geoplat, and from the University of Valencia. I don't know, know if you can see my screen. Yes, I confirm. Okay. Okay. So good morning. My, my name is Javier Chuguia. I'm uh, this Shadow Geothermal Day representing several uh, associations, also the Geothermal Panel of the Renewable Heating and Cooling uh, ETIP. And my talk, my talk will deal with the training aspects of shallow geothermal energy. In particular, I'm going to present today an experience that can be interesting for Europe regarding professional qualification, and in particular, how it was developed in the last years in the Spanish system. So we think that this initiative could be a reference for other countries and could be, let's say, a driver for implementing more qualification and training schemes in, in, across Europe. So I will start uh, with indicating some some uh, some context questions how how the situation looks like today in, in the in the shallow geothermal market in particular, and I will refer then in particular more to this issue of training and how this was materialized in in Spain in Spain with this new qualification system. So just to to start a little bit from from the context part, uh, it is well known. It was discussed now by by Thomas also that the energy transition in Europe has recently, and particularly after this COVID emergency, undergone a great uh, acceleration, and that the plans of the Commission are now much more ambitious. The member the member countries, uh, and also the the Commission is leaving behind these more evolutionary frameworks we were accustomed in the last few years, and now accelerating very much this uh, this trend towards this energy transition. Also in recent times, uh, we are hearing also from Thomas now, there is also a heightened uh, sense of crisis and urgency. In many European countries, we are seeing previously unknown high energy costs associated with these fossil fuels. And there is even talk of shortages, supply problems. So the traditional markets that have sustained the energy systems until now, they are based on fossil fuels, no longer look as reliable and immutable as they did in the past. But how can renewable energies contribute in this in this context, in this framework? We have to acknowledge that there is a lack of recognition of RHC as a whole. We have to not we do not have yet this recognition of other energy sectors. There is still a lot of discussion and talk about hydrogen gases and electrification of the thermal sector, which we often term as a wild electrification. Yet Europe and the nations do not yet perceive the thermal renewable energy sector as a real and tangible possibility to accelerate the transition processes in a cost-efficient efficient way. So we have a communication problem. There is still a lack of knowledge or recognition of the potential of these energy sources and how they can contribute to accelerating the decarbonization of European energy sectors. This is why documents like here, this one, strategies, guidelines are so crucial 
They provide this overview of the present and future of the sector and point to the needs in terms of innovation, but also what are the strengths and weaknesses of these energies, of our energies in the market. So a very recent example is this uh, strategic research and innovation agenda I'm showing here of the geothermal technologies, but there are many others also from these horizontal working groups, which deal with the different uh, sectors of the demand, which is very important. And one example of, of one of these guidelines is uh, one is I'm going to show in this slide now is uh, this. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to move this slide here. This graph includes here, it shows this overview of the expected evolution in recent years and the forecast that the commission is doing, is making for the next future. So here in this bars here, we can see the distribution between the different sectors, the energy sectors, heating is in the yellow, where orange is this renewable heating and cooling. We have also the electricity and the transport and how this evolution has been in the last years and how it is forecasted in the 2030 clean energy policy forecast. So the importance of the thermal energy sector is acknowledged by this, uh, let's say, uh, bar here with the green zone, and it has been increasing as the own commission acknowledges. The new bar that now appears represents the forecast distribution in the year 2030. As we can see, the uh, importance of renewable thermal energies is increasing a lot in this uh, policy forecast. And but also the Commission places an extraordinary faith in the energy efficiency, which, which you can see in the decreasing uh, overall demand. So uh, this is also to do with this, what Thomas was uh, highlighting now about the uh, increased efficiency in building, etc. So how does the next or the future in the in the longer term look like here? So we can see in the next bar that the Commission perceives a scenario that would point to a 50% of the thermal energy required for the year being covered by thermal renewable energies. But we at RHC believe that this framework is a little bit conservative, given the actual situation and that we could strive for a much more ambitious 100% strategy by 2040. Why not? One important thing of having uh, instruments like the RHC is that we can talk together among the different sectors of the RHC. And here you can see the importance that uh, geothermal has in this context. As an exercise of possibility, we wanted in this document to consider how the different sectors of RHC could contribute to this overall demand in a 100% scenario. And you can see here these three zones covering geothermal heat pumps or heat pumps in general, GeoDH, which is also this zone here, and also the deep uh, geothermal electricity. So as you can see in the decarbonization of the thermal sector, geothermal is a key factor, and but and we have a lot of to do really to accomplish this such ambitious growth in the next 20 years. So what do we need to accelerate our position in the market? We have to acknowledge that we are still far from our potential in the geothermal sector, that we have to achieve a much higher scalability that market condition must be substantially improved. And everyone acknowledges that this is repeated also over and over again in the sector, that uh, it is essential to broaden and strengthen the qualification and knowledge base of the professionals who will be driving the sector in these two next decades. Therefore, the qualification and training of professional must be one of the fundamental uh, concepts or pillars in the next, uh, in the next 20 years. But despite the inclusion in the 29 Greta Directive and the subsequent maintenance in the new revision of the Directive of Article 14, specifying the need of a qualification in the different member countries of the installers of shallow geothermal energy, we do not yet have today a European qualification system with the quality, compatibility, and scope that would be required for this task. So, in the 10 years ago, Approximately, the European Geotronic project already set out to achieve some of the first objectives, such as having materials that would allow training both designers and training professionals with homogeneous contents in different countries in Europe. The Geotronic project later became a European not-profit association of the same name, which is nowadays composed of representatives of 11 countries, associations, 
that has continued to maintain this mission in order to advance in the establishment of a pan-European training and qualification system. So where are we at today with that? First of all, a fundamental mission that Geotrainit has set itself is to support the mission of the European RET Directive to establish qualification and certification schemes in all European countries that have an approval basis. To this end, such qualification and certification schemes must should be mutually recognizable by the different member countries. It is also necessary to ensure that the training of senior technicians, designers of geothermal system with sufficient knowledge and perspective to ensure the high quality of future installations and that these are always at the best state of the art. It's also very important that this brand is recognized by the market players. So before commenting the latest development, which I'm going to focus uh, in particular in Spain, I just would briefly comment what means really qualification in this context, in the context of the Euro European qualification system. So we have really two groups, two systems, at the top of this scheme, ranging to five to eight from the European qualification systems, it would include what we call the design levels, ranging from engineers to scientists. But from levels one to four, it is understood that we are qualifying professionals who must act in the market for the construction and maintenance of the facilities. It is precisely at, precisely at these levels that we are at the greatest lack of qualification and certification systems in the different European countries. In fact, most countries lack such a system today, despite the European directive and despite various initiatives, such as the build-up skills programs, which have precisely tried to alleviate this deficiency. For reasons that would take too long to explain today, these initiatives have been only partially successful up to date. So what are we doing? In this general scheme, in which geotraining takes place, we have in the first place a European training committee in charge of guaranteeing the quality and interoperability of the materials, the, the contents on which the training is based in the different countries. In each country, we can see in the table here uh, that there are two key players in this scheme. The associations and in the geothermal market would be represented by each national training association in each country, there are official bodies that watch over the qualifications and certification systems. The National Training Association, in contact with these bodies, would develop the system, or rather the geothermal training contents, according to the rules of each member state. Based on the catalogue of information contents, the training centres, professional schools, training schools, universities, can then be commissioned to carry out the training, examination and certification mission to ensure that the training materials are interoperable and up to date with the state of the art, it is essential that there are the representation of the National Training Committee within the, the European Geotraining Education and Certification Committee itself. So this is the broad scheme. So how does it look like in the case of Spain, in which we have succeeded in the last years in materializing this scheme to set up the new Spanish qualification system? In Spain, qualifications are governed by a catalogue a catalog of qualification under the responsibility of the National Association of Qualifications, whose acronym is INQUAL. This ministerial body is in charge of maintaining standards in terms of qualifications, such as exams and certifications. Apart from the professional schools in Spain, there is a second training structure through the employment offices, an extensive system that allows to qualify and accredite and unemployed people for new qualifications. Returning to the general scheme set up before, here you can see uh, in Spain, Geoplat would be the national training association and turn a member of Geotrinet. In contact with INQUAL, it starts the development of the quality, it started the de development of the qualification system that later the national training system will adopt for the accredit accreditation of shallow geothermal installers. In Spain, there is also a complication that the, that the complication that the vocational training systems depend on the autonomous entities in which the nation is divided. The training centers of these regions must, however, necessarily refer to the catalog to ensure the full mobility of workers within the country. This is how we arrived at the need to not only to have the qualifications in the catalog by INQUAL, according to very strict criteria in terms of contents, taxonomies, ontologies, and training material requirements, but it is also essential that the training centers active in the different regions adopt these qualifications contained in that catalog and transform them into courses that, that, can, that 
can then be offered to potential future professionals in the sector in their respective regions. In our case, it has been essential to count on the collaboration of one of these associations. In this case, it was the Santa Barbara Foundation, which is very active in the regions of Castilla Leon, and which has made it possible to transfer the contents from the catalog to courses that can be offered in the near future. The end result is that there now there is the possibility in Spain to obtain the so-called installed certificate in the field of shallow geothermal energy according to the geotrained rules, but according also to the Spanish system of qualifications. I'm going to give some short details on how this task was accomplished and how it long it took really to set up this system and how it looks like in the present. The, there were great difficulties that we had to face to be able to materialize this program. In 2016, it was established a collaboration framework between GeoTrinet, uh, sorry, between GeoPlat and uh, Inqual to set up the basis for a future framework of qualification in shallow geothermal systems in Spain. This agreement resulted in an intense work between Inqual and other technicians in GeoPlat to translate the knowledge of a specialist in geothermal installations into the complex and sometimes obscure language of ontologies and taxonomies of training according to the European AQF standards. This resulted in an extensive and very detailed catalog of knowledge and skills that level two and three technicians should possess to or in order to be able to perform installations and maintenance in geothermal installations. The work was arduous and extensive, sometimes not without obstacles of a bureaucratic nature, change in people, etc between this qualifications sector and the sector experts themselves, usually inexperienced in the field of professional qualifications. Countless meetings were necessary to translate the contents of the shallow geothermal activity into the language required for inclusion in this catalog. The advantage of this effort is that being fully based on the European AQF standards, it would be relatively feasible to translate all this knowledge to other systems in force in Europe. Therefore, GeoPlat considers that this advance is not only interesting for Spain, but it can also be scalable and interesting for countries that currently lack a valid qualification and certification system. The final result, after four, more than five years of work, was the publication in the official state cassette of uh, Spain in April 27th of this year of two new qualifications in the national catalog. They refer to qualifications level two and three, for air conditioning installers based on geothermal energy, installation and maintenance. Here are the details in the slides. One of these qualification level two is 390 hours of duration, NR70 hand, 670 10 and 7011 for level two and, and three. You can see more details here in this, uh, in this reference. It is very important to comment in this context that it was extremely important to have a norm or standard in Spain to standardize some of the concepts that appear in these qualifications. This allowed, for instance, separating the training into two different well-structured competence units, which are called installation of the zero circuit, that means the connection between the, under, the, the borehole drillings and the machine room and the technical room itself. So these are the units in, in which these two competences are clearly separated. So I'm towards the end of my talk. After the announcement of these uh, qualifications, uh, as a consequence of this inclusion, there was also the inclusion in the catalog of training courses in the national employment system of a new qualification oriented towards courses given to unemployed people. And also thanks to the above mentioned collaboration with the Santa Barbara Foundation active in one of the Spanish regions, it has been possible also to include also a first training and qualification course oriented towards obtaining the so-called professional card for geothermal installers, following the qualifications of the national catalog. With this, Spain is in a position to accredit professionals of shallow geothermal energy with full interoperability according to the scheme outlined by GeoTrinet. The detailed development of the course and contents of level three is still lacking. So this is something we have still to do in the next future. And although already commented before this training is included in the national catalog already. So to conclude, I would like to comment that, that there is a scheme known also as Europass that would allow mutual recognition of training for European professionals that would be easily recognized, recognizable between different countries. This would open the door for a rapid deployment and recognition of mutual qualification schemes between countries following a similar philosophy 
to that developed in Spain. As I have pointed out, the inclusion of Geoplat as one of the founding members of Geotrainet and its close collaboration with national organizations allows also for a complete updating operation of these training contents in Spain. But there is still a lot to do. I believe that nowadays we, are talking, we have taken a significant step to ensure that in Europe the existence of a professional qualification and certification of people active in the shallow geothermal sector that brings us closer to the ambition of being one of the energy sources protagonizing the energy transition in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier, for this presentation. I just want to remind all of you regarding this presentation. So it's an input given by Javier today. And next week, same time, uh, no, from yes, 10 to 11, we have a debate on how we can replicate uh, this uh, best practice from Spain to, to other countries. Do you have any questions? No? So maybe just one question for you. Um, do you have some idea uh, if you have enough geothermal heat pump installers already in Spain? So because you are mentioning about an exponential growth of uh, geothermal heat pumps installation in, in Spain, but do you think that you have enough installers or, or you really need to, to have more installers? I, I think there is, there is in general a lack of installers. There are not enough installers. So it, it's true that there is a, that has, it has been a, lot, a exponential growth, a very fast growth in the last years. But I think it's mostly due to a statistical uh, effect. That means that in the in the last two years there was an effort by the ministry to update the uh, existing installations. So many installations that were done already before have been have emerged in this last in this last year. So. Uh, it's true that it has, it has been a large growth, but the potential in the market is much, much higher. So I think the lack of, of installers is one of the barriers uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this context. It is true that also in the last years, many some of the associations like ATEFIR, which is very active in the sector, have been training, uh, let's say, more designer level uh, professionals. And let's say it would be equal four to five, I would say. And this has been very important. So this is outside this system I have been showing here. Uh, and this awareness and acknowledgement of professionals active by ATEC has been very important to, let's say, accelerate the, uh, the, the number of installations and, uh, and these numbers you have been mentioning. Thank you, Javier, <clears throat> for this presentation and, and this uh, inputs given to that. And uh, we welcome next week the discussion. We yes, can sure, have sure. I think it's a very interesting perspective to, to make this, uh, this uh, let's say, a similar exercise in other countries that may lack of these systems and could use these experiences, let's say, uh, not having five years of work, uh, but accelerating, let's say, this, this type of, of establishment of qualification systems. Good, good. So now we are moving the topic and we give the floor to Thomas Novak, the Surgeon General of the European Heat Pump Association to present um, their view and uh, the paper they have just published on energy taxation. So the floor is yours, Thomas, and we welcome your presentation and after a small debate on the topic. Yeah, thank you very much. And also <clears throat> thank you, Xavier, Xavier for, for the work that you have done more than uh, actually, I think that's there's much more work behind what you have just presented so quickly. And I think that re really deserves applause because this certification and training uh, activities on the European level are really important. If you allow me one comment, I think that in overall Europe, we may have enough installers. They may not just do the right thing. And that's why uh, what I will present now has an importance on the whole market development. We are discussing as we speak, um, or I call this this uh, presentation, correcting the cost imbalances through taxation in the Fit for 55 package. Uh, we have presented a paper to, the to that respect. You can find it on our website. And the main challenge that we see is that heat pumps are at the moment um, the most efficient and cleanest solution that you can use for heating and also for cooling. They have a number of additional benefits, but they are still too expensive. And too expensive is this relative term. Everybody says we want cheap heating, heating has to be affordable. But what we are really seeing is that it is not the heat pump that is too expensive, it's the fossil solution that is too cheap. 
and to cheap meaning that the costs occur, they are only paid by society. And I will talk about what I mean with that. We are looking at heat pumps from different angles as European heat pump associations. So for us, geothermal is just one variation. There is air source, there is different heat pumps using waste heat. And you can see that we see them also across uh, the board in white goods, in cars, in residential buildings, in commercial buildings, in industrial applications, and also in district heating. So just to leave one comment here, there is a complementarity between district heating and heat pumps. The markets have been growing a little bit like crazy. You can see from 2015 onwards, we had double digit growth. There was a dent in the market in 2020, uh, not unexpected because it was just simply more difficult to bring the products into end users' buildings. But we expect that in 2021, this dent will be overcompensated. Uh, what initial forecast that I see with my members with national associations lead to the assumption that we probably have something like um, 20% market growth. So we are looking at 1.6 million in 2020, 20% on top of it, somewhere between 1.9 and 2 million heat pumps, and that includes all energy sources and as well sanitary hot water units. So we're, we're touching the ceiling of 2 million units. And that's why I would call this the decade of heat pumps. Both EJEC and ourselves have been really pushing for this technology for a long time. Um, Philippe and myself, I think we have been in so many meetings, Xavier likewise. But now it's also recognized on the international level. The IEA report called Net Zero by 2050 was published this year and says we will have 1.8 billion heat pumps by 2050. And they are also recognizing very, very pronounced that there is a need for industrial applications. They say 500 megawatts per month. And that is tremendous if you know what's typically installed in that area. On a European level, we are, we are recognizing the EU energy systems integration strategy, and this strategy was published uh, in July 2019 already. It foresees that by 2030, we should have 40% of all residential buildings and 65% of all commercial buildings heated efficiently with electricity. And since energy efficiency first prevails, this can be translated quite directly into heat pumps, meaning 50 million heat pumps by 2030 in Europe and remind you that we have about 15 million at the moment, 14 million of that being heating heat pumps for 13 point something, five. And that means a factor of four to increase. And this is topped up by increased targets, a 40% renewable target as a suggestion. Inside that directive, you also see 49% of renewable energy in the building sector, a 36% energy efficiency target, again by 2030, and 55% emission reduction with regards to CO2. And all this can be done by heat pumps, so it means that the requirement for solutions will lead to demand for heat pump technology. I talked to a number of our industry players and they say, yes, we can do that, four times as many heat pumps, that's fine, but we need a framework that triggers demand. And then that's where we started to look at the taxation situation. And the first thing that you encounter is that electricity is taxed much more heavy than fossil energy, and that's across the board. This graph shows you that in Italy, uh, you need to have an efficiency of three, seasonal efficiency of three, uh, to break even when it comes to the comparison between fossil energy and heat pump based heating and that's independent of energy source so that's likewise true for a geothermal unit that can achieve that easier and also for an air source unit anyways if the investment then is much more expensive then it means that the end user has difficulties in overcompensating the additional investment cost over the life cycle the lifetime of the product and that, of course, limits the interest, limits demand. If we look at which taxations, and, and now I, I, take, I, I added this additional uh, slide from KPMG, which additional tax measures are uh, foreseen in the EU Green Deal, then you can see that we are looking at an ETS that's currently applying to electricity, supposed to be extended to shipping, road transport, and buildings. We will have a carbon border adjustment mechanism. We have the energy taxation directive that is reviewed as we speak, and plastics tax are maybe not so important for us at the moment. 
So looking at the minimum energy taxation rates from the energy taxation directive, then it is actually quite a disaster. This directive didn't do much in the past. And if you look at the new proposals, I translated this for you here for the different applications, gas and oil or non-sustainable biofuels, minimum taxation rate 10 euros 75 per giga gigajoule translated means 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, that, that would be something. But, but when it comes to heating, it's slashed by a factor of 10. So we end up at 0.32 cents per kilowatt hour. And you, you will agree with me that this will not change the situation. Natural gas, LPG, the same thing. Motor fuel tax heavier, heating tax less. Sustainable biofuels even less. The only light at this end of the tunnel is that electricity is taxed least because it's recognized that the emissions from electrification will be very small. So now we can only hope, and there I'm still looking for clarity, that the member states are obliged to put the same proportionality into that taxation regime. So meaning if you don't want to tax gas and oil a lot, then you have to tax electricity even less. That would be a benefit of that regulation. Then we, are, then we have looked at which countries are using a CO2 price and surprisingly there is quite a few with Germany being the latest addition to that group. Um, now in this, in this uh, fuel trading law there is a taxation level of 25 euros per ton of CO2 emitted. It's increasing to 30 tons of CO2 this in, in 2022 and ends or is supposed to end in 2025 at 60 or maximum 65 but we will see what the new government says to that. The interesting thing about this is that all these countries do not see social uproar. So having a CO2 tax to internalize the external effects of fossil energy use is not leading to a complete meltdown of democracy if it's done properly. And that's the point. If you look at Switzerland, for example, one of the highest prices that we have, um, most of the revenues of the ETS are used to reduce the costs for social uh, for, for health insurance and one third is used for to finance efficiency projects, renovation projects, so that actually the proactive people are getting a benefit and those that are the laggards, they have to pay. And typically, very few people have mercy with people that don't want to move if moving makes economic sense. Let's look at the CO2 emission allowance price. This is actually by now already an old graph, It's but it's really only uh, only, uh, is it four weeks old? No, yeah, 16th of, of uh, November, that's when I copied it in. But yesterday the price was 80 euros uh, per ton as we speak. So the increase level, the, the, the value has increased much. And that shows you also how much society pays at the moment for the cheap fossil heat. So if we apply a CO2 price of 80 tons, 80 euros per ton to heating and take an average house, then you have annual costs of around 560 euros, in 10 years, 5,600 euros, and in 20 years, 11,200 euros. And that's roughly covering the delta between the investment costs of, of today's fossil energy, if you take a renovation project, and a new heat pump. Depending, of course, where you are, geothermal might be even more expensive, but imagine that this is not the final price. Imagine that this price can actually increase 280, 200 euros. Uh, some assessments even say the proper price should be 600 euros per ton. Anyways, until these, econom these economies of scale kick in and the price is increasing further and end users take a long-term perspective, we think that also um, subsidies for, for this renewable heating need to be put into place maybe real subsidies that run out after five years, after 10 years, but they're limited really in scope. And then of course it also needs support if we want to uh, realize the decarbonization of heating. A support for all, we say, not only the poor, because it's one thing to have the money, it's the other thing to choose the right solution. So my favorite support scheme here is super homes in, in Ireland, it's now called uh, electric super homes. Um, it gives you support when assessing the building, when it gives you a design suggestion, it gives you a technology solution selection, advice on financing, and adds a quality check after the installation. I think that's also quite in line with what Xavier has said before. This is something that those expert installers could actually provide. So advice needs to be given to all, subsidies to those that have not enough funds, and the income for these subsidies could be the ETS.
And that's why we have then, and this is a new table that we are we're, we're working on a new paper now. We have looked at uh, the discussion on the introduction of the ETS, the extension of the ETS to buildings, and you see that there is a lot of resistance, and a lot of people are very unhappy with the proposals that the Commission has made and say, no, but we can do this better. We can achieve the same target of emission reduction by stricter effort sharing regulation, by EPVD that should uh, set targets for low or zero carbon heating. We could even ban fossil heaters or we could introduce a CO2 limit uh, like in the car industry. But if we you anal analyze all these, they, these, all these measures may achieve the same effect but none of them provides an income so that you could actually finance all the measures. And all of these measures, if you want to have an intended effect, will increase the cost of heating to the end user. So from our perspective, the combination of a proper ETS extended to buildings and a social climate fund that is then providing a means to finance both the advice and the subsidies to the end user is necessary to achieve a proper decarbonization of the building stock. So in short, we are supportive as EHPA for the ETS because we think the internalization of external effects is absolutely necessary. And this needs to be backed up by a financing mean that is redistributing the income from the ETS. We think that ETS 2 needs to be um, extended to the building sector and combined with the Social Climate Fund to achieve this. Then there was not going to be any yellow vests. And we think that it's complementary to other policy measures. So if there is... Uh, the renewables directive that sets a minimum requirement for heating that's very helpful but it should be augmented complemented by an ETS if there is EPVD that's very helpful but it should be augmented by an ETS and likewise for the energy efficiency directive so then I close with that uh, we think we hope that the ETS will be extended to the building sector because we, th we think this is an essential tool to decarbonize heating and cooling on all levels thank you very much Thank you, Thomas, for your dynamism and indeed the, the good message you are, you are providing. Um, just maybe just a remark on, on the topic on ETS and Social Climate Fund. It's not part of the Shallow Geothermal Days, but as EJEC, who organized this Friday an event on this topic with some members of the Parliament, you are all invited to, to participate, to brainstorm a bit on, on, on this topic. Wonderful. I don't know if we have already some questions, but my, my question to you, Thomas, is that indeed, the issue we see in European energy policy is that we have some piece of regulation which are good. Here you mentioned improvement of um, the energy taxation we have seen before, EPBD, EED. One issue we have noticed as, as EJEC is, is, a, is a structural issue is the internal market for gas. Because since the establishment of Iran for gas, we see a lot of measures to protect the gas market to not only of supply. So it means we are seeing a full supply of gas every time and, and some protection. Is for you a solution to, to ask how we can create a market for each services, so to go beyond gas in the energy and cooling sector? Yeah, I, I think we have discussed that before. I don't know. This is something we haven't we haven't really spent a lot of time on. My question would be, can you really compare gas, which is a commodity traded in the different countries with um, with heat that is normally rather local unless you have uh, an energy grid but then again you don't have you don't have a, a widespread trading of that heat i think what we should do is we should consider that the same type of um, market attractiveness for trading heat should be established so it's not the same it's not a heat market but it's a market that allows for heat to become a commodity that is traded on the local level from our perspective what is really essential for that is the the renovation of the electricity taxation situation because if you want to have heat as a service uh, and that applies to both all the heat pumps, geothermal likewise. But I, I would guess even if we talk about hybrid solutions, including uh, biomass and solar thermal or direct geothermal, or we put all this together into a district energy grid, then we would still need 
uh, an, a legal framework that makes this attractive. And what we see is that the taxation of electricity versus the lack of taxation on fossil energy is typically making this not the case. It is not attractive at the moment to offer heat as a service from a business perspective. And that is, that is another showstopper for the energy transition because also for individual end users, you and me could benefit from providing flexibility to the grid because we have this flexibility inside our own systems, in, in the building core, in the drill, in the geothermal, um, uh, well, in the, in the source. But we, it makes no sense to us at the moment because we pay too much for the electricity and the electricity is burdened with, uh, with many taxes and levies that actually could be collected otherwise. And I think we all share the same view that we need not uh, uh, any more distorted competition, we need a fair competition yeah. in all sorts of technology. We are not afraid by our competitiveness. We know that geothermal has to do with heat pumps. We can be really competitive in a, in a long-term perspective. It has been highlighted. I really recommend you to read the IA report from 1st of December on it and Queen mentioning that indeed these technologies are competitive, but they are lacking from a level playing field. Yeah. Thank you, and Thomas. Uh, yeah. I've seen ECOS, the ECOS report it says exactly the same. So yeah. co the competitiveness in itself if everybody pays for their external effects, is no discussion. Mm -mm -mm. And indeed, all together, all technologies will be able to decarbonize, but not yeah. increasing increasing the prices. Thank you again, Thomas. And um, now we are going to the last presenter, but not the least, Gregor Gödel from the Ducal Survey of Austria to present a different perspective at a city level how we plan geothermal um, with heat pumps uh, in urban planning and about the traffic light system. Gregor, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Philip, for the introduction and invitation um, to this uh, very nice event. Um, so I would like to build a bridge now from legal aspects, technological aspects, and uh, financial aspects uh, to geoscientific aspects. As I'm working at the Geological Survey of Austria, and I'm also part of the Geoenergy Exit Group of uh, EU Geo Surveys. So. So we just click away my window. Uh, here we go. So my presentation is about uh, traffic light systems and urban planning. So I would like to, to expand it a little bit more, talking about uh, uh, urban shallow geothermal energy use and uh, new management approaches, which are hardly, hardly required in the future. So uh, what are the guiding questions of uh, my thoughts and my presentation I would like to give today? So first of all, of course, why is it important to talk about managing urban shallow geothermal energy? And what is, what, what is the difference to the traditional, let's say, fin single family home use and which challenges need to be made? And uh, based on these challenges, what are the implications on urban shallow geothermal management for authorities, uh, for city planners, and so on? Uh, we would also like to show some first concepts, how this kind of uh, urban shallow tree farm uh, uh, management and monitoring could look like uh, and uh, uh, conclude to measure to promote and foster urban um, management and uh, what is also very important these times how digitalization may help to reach these goals and finally because I'm working in the geological survey I would uh, give a few statements of how geological survey organizations, especially on the national, but also on the European level, when we look at uh, EU geo surveys, can support uh, shallow geothermal energy management in urban areas. So, but let's go back to the first question. So, why is it important to talk about uh, shallow geothermal in urban areas? Of course, there is a dem demographic uh, reason for it. So, uh, until now, already 75% of Europeans live in urban environments and uh, the forecast to 2050 will say it will be 84 percent probably a little bit more so more it's a it's a big uh, big part of our society who lives in cities and uh, these cities are currently supplied like in my hometown vienna uh, 40 percent by gas fossil individual fossil boilers similar uh, situation in many other european countries so we need to think about how this, the new building, but moreover the existing building can be transformed uh, to reach uh, European energy and climate goals. 
and what are the implications on shallow geothermal energy use? So we will look at more larger systems, so larger capacities. We have to think about systems connecting buildings, especially retrofitted buildings. And uh, there is a, another important uh, maybe shift of paradigm. Uh, some colleagues in Austria say uh, they call it already geothermal 2.0, but it's not an official term, meaning the shift from pure heating, pure cooling to heating and store and cooling and storage. So meaning that there is a new role geothermal uh, could play in the future, especially in so-called uh, low temperature heating cooling networks uh, where all these exchanges, but uh, also of course aquifer systems um, have a predominantly storage role. But if you look at all these installations in urban environments, which was also indicated, sorry, in my, my first picture here, as you can see here, a cross cut uh, through a city, it means that um, that the underground becomes more complex, or be better saying, using the underground, especially urban groundwater bodies. So we have a lot of uh, mutual influences, uh, neighboring influences, so-called summation effects, topped, by, of course, by climate change, the sealing of the surface of leading to this uh, so-called um, urban heat islands. And the management needs to deal with this, this phenomena. So what, uh, is the difference uh, between urban and non-urban. So using ground source heat pumps has a long tradition in many European countries, uh, for instance, Austria, more than 40 years, and there are well-established guidelines, uh, rules. But uh, as indicated in this picture here on the upper right-hand side, they are more focusing on single building use, small capacity use, which is, of course, still is the, pre uh, the, the dominating factor in the in the um, um, application, the European market, um, uh, but uh, we need to look into the future. So the question is, are these uh, well-established uh, planning instruments are fit for urban? So meaning that we are going away from pure heating to storage, that we look at larger capacities, that we look at uh, high density of systems, uh, including neighboring effects and so on. The second important aspect is the regulation. Of course, regulation also uh, was looking at the typical market uh, uh, participant in the last uh, 20, 30 years. And in many countries, not, not all, of course, uh, but uh, for instance, once again, like in Austria, is, uh, um, licensing is uh, following the first come, first served uh, approach, meaning who, who claims first the right will get it, irrespectively of the, uh, let's say, the overall impact or the, uh, the meaningfulness of, um, of, of, of your use. So it means that a single uh, small scale use can block a larger uh, joint use or common use of uh, shallow geothermal. And on the other hand, we are, have the problem of uh, uh, increasing tension field between promoting renewable energy sources and uh, environmental protection. Uh, especially when it comes to groundwater bodies, and this is also uh, where authorities uh, often have uh, quite prejudged opinions in some regions, making it very hard to install uh, ground source heat pumps. But another aspect is data. So especially in urban areas, we face the problem that it's not easy to get good data on the subsurface, that there are subsurface installations uh, which should or need to be mapped in the three-dimensional space. Uh, and without this data, how can we make uh, sound management decisions? Uh, so there needs to be a shift also on the way how we collect data uh, to, to understand uh, dynamic processes in the subsurface, especially in highly dynamic systems like groundwater bodies. And last but not least, of course, related to data is the planning instruments. Not talking about the planning of an installation itself, but planning for authorities for planners, uh, which have to overlook uh, summation effects, which have to overlook the whole picture on the city quarter or full city scale. And uh, of course we have instruments, but they are quite uh, complex to use. Uh, you need to be trained, like you see here, this picture of the FIVLO simulation. And uh, uh, this might not be appropriate instrument for, for let's say local authorities, which, uh, which have to do a lot of uh, different things, not just uh, working on shallow geothermal, of course. So in the project MUSE, which I also represent today, and I also represent the previous project uh, linked to MUSE, 
was GeoBlast CE. We were talking very much about uh, adaptive management cycles, integrative and adaptive. Both, uh, as you can see here, have the shape of a cycle. That means it's not a linear process where you have a starting point and you have an ending point. You don't look at the whole picture, but you repeat. The basic idea is that uh, both of these concepts, which are very similar, they very much rely on information systems. So information systems meaning having GIS maps, uh, like traffic light maps, for instance, but um, resource maps as well, which are used to make planning decisions, but once again get uh, fed by new data through application procedures. So for realizing such systems, uh, of course, the logical step is to link such web information systems with e-government solution, meaning that the, the exchange of information between um, um, authorities and applicants uh, is fully digital in a predefined format. So my colleague Alejandro Garcia uh, prepared, proposed in the MUSE project a kind of an adaptive management circle, which looks, of course, very complex, but I just made here a linear uh, um, sketch of the whole process, outlining the most important steps. So, of course, before you do some kind of management, you need to do some baseline monitoring, especially looking at groundwater bodies, meaning that you have to be aware of the situation, the terminal situation, the hydraulic situation of the groundwater body, meaning that you are, identify where are your heat islands, uh, where are the critical zones, where are the non-critical zones. Uh, based on this baseline monitoring, you can go and define your management problems. So, meaning what is the objectives you would like to reach with your measures, uh, define a strategy and uh, key performance indicators. Uh, this could mean that you flexibilize uh, the thresholds, how to, for licensing of a use, for instance, if your groundwater body is already too hot, you try to uh, um, be more strict on cooling, but be more flexible on heating to reduce this excess heat in the groundwater body. And of course, uh, implementation monitoring means that uh, uh, above all, focusing on environmental monitoring that you try to create, get new data in collaboration with the um, users of the systems in, in the area where you are responsible for it as an authority. But of course, these concepts are quite uh, complex. So uh, we discussed about the market dynamic, and this is a sketch from, the, from last year, that we have to consider the different market conditions in Europe. So meaning that if you are still at the very beginning uh, of uh, your market development in a country where, <coughs> where the density of installation is quite uh, low, uh, it means that such complex systems might uh, kill the process, and you might uh, hinder the development. But on the other hand, and this is also a, a challenge, as you can see in Sweden or Switzerland, for instance, when you already have a very well-developed market and you have uh, given the grants, the permits, it's hard to change and uh, the systems, uh, these uh, licenses later on, if they are valid, uh, to, to avoid neighboring influences. So the meaning is, uh, the meaning is uh, that um, you have to find the right point in time where you start thinking about integrative management. And it might affect the legal framework, So, but also providing um, benefits and opportunities, meaning that uh, based on this uh, kind of simplific uh, um, based on this integrative management approach, you could try to offer simplifications for small scale users and simplifications of legal licensing for balanced users. And uh, the best uh, way how to, to manage this is just to to map the energy content which you have available at a certain plot. Of course, giving a clear advantage to ball heat exchangers because they are less influencing than groundwater uh, heat pumps. And if you go beyond this boundary, you're considered as, as a large uh, scale unit, might be given priority to community use, like uh, using excess heat for, for local uh, heating networks by public energy suppliers or energy service providers and uh, not uh, fostering this individual use, consuming a lot of your neighboring plots just for one single building. The other approach is that you provide the cost-efficient telemetric monitoring devices. There are very good examples from Munich uh, where 
Systems were created with uh, a unit prices less than 100 euros, which could be offered to small scale units, uh, for instance, monitoring the temperature of your uh, production well of your ground uh, water heat exchanger. And these data automatically feed into such systems. And on the other hand, you could provide be more uh, consistent and uh, strict on large scale units with monitoring because the extra costs for installing monitoring are quite low compared to the total investment costs. And as I mentioned before about the adaptive licensing procedures, it's very important to really uh, tailor your licensing criteria to the actual conditions of the subsurface, meaning that you uh, foster the uh, development in a certain direction. When it's too hot, foster more heating, uh, giving that you reduce uh, the groundwater temperature, for instance, and of course, uh, prioritization. Uh, this is quite uh, 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 complex because most countries' law doesn't uh, allow it. So I talked before about web information systems and now going back to the, to the, the title of this talk with traffic light systems. So if you look at web information systems, we have two different domains. The first domain is the expert domain, which is focusing on geoscientific data. You can see here, Groundwater temperature map for the city of Vienna, which was created this year, but it's not so easy to interpret for non-experts. And so we, our task as the geological survey so, uh, is to translate this data in simply understandable uh, maps. And in, in, as you see here in a traffic light map, uh, just saying if it's possible, or you have some risks, or if there is no, there is no limitations of use. This is not just a geoscientific map; it's also a geo, geoscientific data interpret patent by policies and the legal framework because most of these red colored or magenta colored uh, parts there um, doesn't allow you to install a ground uh, source heat pump because of legal restrictions. Another uh, uh, kind of uh, um, translation of geoscientific data is those in for, for planners not being geoscientists. So if you have a thermal conductivity map, the energy panel will not do anything with it. Uh, but uh, there are uh, workflows recently developed and existing how to translate this in energy units, for instance. And uh, we we did this in, in the MUSE project, but also in others. Uh, we also look at a very sim simplified units, giving a reference to space uh, requirements. So an energy panel can get the first impression and that, that's the, the main focus, to raise awareness, to, to receive a first impression, how much uh, of the energy need of your, of your land property can be covered by the system to make first decision. So it's not, I have to point this out, it's not a detailed planning tool and it's not our, our, our ambition to create such things. And when we come to the instruments, uh, there are a lot of approaches since years how to deal with this summation effect in a cost-effective way. On the right-hand side, you see an example from Basel, from uh, Janis Epting. Uh, the, this group uh, did a lot uh, how to, 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 to work with semi-analytic and numerical uh, methods, how to, to uh, make such kind of, uh, let's say, not real-time, this is not necessary, but close to real-time um, situation maps um, of uh, groundwater bodies. And this is still a, uh, it's a, it's still a, a, a great challenge because on the one hand we need to be very cost efficient and resource efficient because the local authorities may, might not have the resources to do complex uh, interpretation processes. On the other hand, we we should be quite flexible, uh, quite. Uh, quite uh, easily to update so that planning decisions can be re repeated and can be made integrative. On the left hand side, you see an example for Vienna where we did uh, created a map for city planners to see about all um, limitations and the resources available at a certain um, city development area. So coming already to the end of my very quick presentation, so try to answer the last question. So how could geological survey support uh, this management process? Uh, first of all, national geological surveys, as I'm working at, they don't have a mandate uh, to be a local authority. So we are not giving, providing licenses. But what we, are, what we do as uh, have as a huge survey, we have a strong network connecting uh, more than 40 countries in Europe and uh, neighboring areas. 
So what what is um, what we do is a consultancy. So we consult, uh, of course, decision makers, but we also want to consult and subsidize uh, local authorities uh, with expert knowledge on state-of-the-art methodologies. But what is even more important is uh, to provide some infrastructure. So it does, it's not necessary in federal states like uh, Austria, Germany, uh, that we need to have a number of different, but maybe similar but different information systems or web environments. It's better to have one uniform system, which is in the ideal case also comparable between different European countries. And uh, last but not least, it's also important when it comes to regulations to, to look at beyond the borders. And uh, also did the MUSE is to compare the different legal situation. This is also quite helpful, helpful for decision makers to see how other countries do it, that they, you, that they make, they are more, let's say, um, positive than to, to adapting the legal framework. Yeah, having this said, I'm coming to the end of my presentation, and I'm very happy to answer your questions. And you can see here, if you're interested in news, uh, the link to our, to our project website. So thanks a lot. Philippe? Thank you, Gregor, for this presentation. I need some clarifications were needed on this topic because uh, Perfect like system is implemented just in in few countries. Do we have some question from the audience today? Yes, uh, I I would like to make a question to Gregor. So thank you very much for your nice presentation. It's really amazing how we can really plan. Uh, it's a uh, to, to one one comment and one question. One one the question mm -hmm. is uh, in your traffic light system, are you considering mainly hydrogeological aspects or also? other types of uh, collision with infrastructures or uh, buildings uh, or, or, or other aspects which are not only let's say linked to the to the ground yeah uh, we we um, most of these aspects are linked to the ground what is not uh, what is not shown but not in all pilot areas of news portrait but in summer is existing subsurface infrastructure like tunnels you can see here these red lines maybe it's not so easy visible these are railway tunnels and which are a problem because if you're not aware of this and you want to drill somewhere you might end up in a in a problem and Vienna doesn't have a full 3D model of the subsurface. This is something we are demanding at the city administration that the cities need to have such things in the future. Mm -hmm. And my, my comment or question also is you you do mm -hmm. uh, how to link this to the very important question of the uh, sustainable energy action plans which is I think a key element now in the in the in the let's say local decision making. Let's say in terms of what is the potential of decarbonization, how to communicate this to these authorities and how to integrate mm -hmm. these plans. I think it's a critical aspect, and I, I guess you have a lot of experience there, and uh, perhaps you can comment. Yeah, yeah we tried uh, as I met here this process. It's quite similar to to the proposed workflow for uh, uh, sustainable energy action plans. So starting with the baseline monitoring and updating these plans, uh, we did uh, had a lot of consultation for the city of Vienna since uh, several years, uh, and and it's now uh, getting a little bit more visible for the energy planners uh, that 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 uh, it's useful to have such maps to make a decision when it comes to prioritization. The meaning that if you, you of course, the first choice is still connected to district heating. If district heating is not available, or if you can propose a more efficient solution, then uh, the city provides maps on alternative uh, solutions. And uh, and since, um, yeah, I think one, two years, we are now ready that uh, uh, shallow geothermal uh, is part uh, and and they can offer some uh, of these uh, very simple maps. In many cases, like here, you don't need to have a quite complex maps and giving uh, a spatial specific uh, energy <laughs> units, for instance. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor. Thank you, Javier. We are about to, to conclude uh, our event. So can I ask all panelists of today maybe to, to switch on again the webcam and to provide a, a last comment and conclusion. So maybe we can start with you, Thomas Garbetian. Yeah, uh, thank you, Philippe. Um, indeed, I mean, uh, I just think I will... Uh... Just a question, because we are in December now, close to Christmas. So do you have a wish list for closing this year? 
how we can develop more geothermal heat pump? Uh, well, I mean, uh, let's say I hope Santa brings us a, a, a lot of nice presents. Um, indeed, I, I mainly I think I will uh, put in my wish list that uh, I do hope we have very uh, strong and interesting proposals from the Commission to really phase out fossil fuels from uh, from the building sector uh, because this is really where uh, where we need to to start at this point. Sorry, I was, I was muted. The second one is Javier. Okay, thank, thank you very much for these really nice presentations. And uh, I, I love this, uh, um, let's say, exciting view also by, by Thomas no, of this great future for, for heat pumps. And obviously, we are part of this uh, heat pump, uh, uh, let's say, technology. We have been fighting a lot of time um, to see also a better understanding of the sector. And I think we have done a lot, but uh, the future will be, I think, uh, very, very exciting in the next years and and also very challenging. <laughs> so that, that my wish list is that we continue with this, I think, a very good coordination and, uh, and uh, let's say, removing the barriers and, and the challenges. Okay, and what is uh, expected from the heat pump industry? So. Yeah, I think uh, we have a gift for the Commission that the gift is we have the technology available and you can be more ambitious than you think. Uh, we shouldn't let other people, the naysayers that always tell us it's too expensive, it can't be done, discuss, uh, lead the discussion. I think the Commission, Kadri Simpson, Franz Timmermans, they need to recognize that we have the technologies available. Uh, our job is to make it more efficient, easier to install. Their job and that trickles down down to the regional and local administrative level is to make the whole um, first the energy system more leaning towards renewable energy needs to be cheap needs to be cheaper than fossil energy i think that's very clear in the context of 2050 but then and i didn't talk about that and i think that would be a whole event in itself this whole administrative burden that we still have and gregor showed it very nicely what needs to be done to make it easier. Uh, I, I could tell you a personal story on how difficult it was to get my geothermal drilling into the ground. And you go from city to city and people don't have the same education level and make different requirements, more complex. <laughs> and what's most difficult here is that this will kill the process of your construction site. And so time is, an, is, is a very, very important aspect. Administrative procedures need to take that into consideration. Thank you. It's a good point, and probably it deserves uh, more than one event. But uh, simplification of permitting and planning will be also one of our main activity for lobbying the rest directive. And to conclude, Gregor, what? Uh, yeah, thank you. thank you. It was really uh, fantastic to see the different uh, points of view from different perspectives in this uh, conference this year once again. I also, if I have a wishing list, uh, I think that we will see a lot of changes in the next uh, years. I think that um, still believe that uh, heat pumps, district heating, there will be the major uh, concept uh, for um, enabling this uh, green transition. And I'm happy that geothermal can be part of both sectors. Uh, and I think we will see a lot of new concepts uh, looking at the um, uh, multivalent, bivalent heat pumps, having air and ground using the benefits of both systems. And uh, finally, I hope when we talk, talk again in 10 years from now that we see a lot of European cities having uh, heat pumps and ground source heat pumps or shallow geothermal energy use part of the um, energy action plans and that there are pilots which really uh, use uh, these integrative adaption systems. They are keen enough to go away from this first come first served and uh, very old fashioned way how to look at uh, managing shallow geothermal. Thanks. True. Thank you all. I just see that we have received a, a question on permitting, but indeed uh, we have a good news that uh, it, it's Birgit Sana, we all know him from Germany. Good news from the SA Germany as the grid book among mining and water law seems to have been unlocked eventually after decades of problems. So we can always find good solutions. And indeed, my word of conclusion is that we are not at the start because all these stories started already some time ago, but 
we are the start of an exponential growth, which will make us one of the key drivers for the energy transition. It pump for sure, and with a large contribution of geothermal. So we need to really uh, join all the forces to be successful because it will be in the interest of all of us. I thank you all for having attending this webinar. We were about 100 people, so it's again a good attendance because we know there are so many webinars today that it's not easy to attend all of them. So thank you all for having attended the webinar. Thank you for the panelists for the excellent presentation and discussion. Hope to see you soon, and I wish you a good day. Goodbye. Bye bye. bye. Have a nice Hi, Philippe. Javier. Hello, Please. you are there. <laughs> now, just to, to comment briefly uh, uh, for, for the session uh, next uh, next Thursday. <laughs> yes. So we have we have some 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 events uh, before us. Huh? <laughs> uh, so just one, one moment because we are still. Oh, yeah, we are still. Yeah. I just close the the event once again. Yes, I, I will wait. <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, the best, Javier, I, I contact you via Teams, okay? Okay. I send you Teams, okay. We'll close the event. <clears throat>